much is correct. <laughs> so, but I want to welcome you all to this session and a special warm welcome to Marie van Wijk and Prof. Liz Wolfart from the University of Pretoria. We're looking forward to your presentation uh, regarding the mob mentality in an online program. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Anki. I'm going to start and then this will take over from me at a certain point. So you might wonder what instigated a title like mob mentality in an online program. But let me start by showing you a quote of one of our most enthusiastic online facilitators when I suggest that he can either delete a question or just change the mark to zero. Both ways the answer will not count. So what causes online facilitators to react to so much, with so much emotion? Like Scar from The Lion King after the death of Mufasa, the University of Pretoria embarked on a new journey when the university's first fully online postgraduate diploma launched six weeks after the COVID-19 pandemic was announced. Since then, more than a thousand students has registered for this online qualification. However, the literature on the emergence of herd or mob mentality within a large online class is quiet. So in this study, we explored the evidence of mob mentality in a fully online PG dip through the personal communication and discussion board posts between students, the program coordinator, facilitators and learning designers and two themes arise. So I'll take over from here. So uh, welcome everybody. I'm Liz. Thank you to Marie who've set, set the scene so nicely for us. So we saw two particular themes and I'm going to take you through that before we, we, we pose the argument, uh, what we think needs to be done next or, or about this new phenomenon. So the first is my dramatic emotional response and the second is my right to write. So let's see where we got those two themes from. So the first one was culmination of text that was extremely and deliberately rude. And so now we're not talking here about ad hoc uh, messages that people could perhaps interpret, because I've seen that as well with email communication and, and digital communication where people can interpret emotion. This was very obvious. Secondly, uh, that the student was disinterested in any kind of rational discussion. And thirdly, that there was an attempt to try to shame the institution and its staff. So there you can see in a the, the slide, the image there is, I'm surrounded by idiots. That's the way we often feel. So just as an example, for the first um, uh, th thing that uh, contributed to the theme, so text that was extremely and deliberately rude is even though we had a netiquette video that we actually specifically made to point out how we're going to communicate one another and why it's important in public health and not to leave a permanent digital trail, you still get an email from students to say when we refer them back, stop hiding behind the netiquette. Also, those who are not interested in rational discussions, such as hot in Durban today, I'm too old and I'm too busy, I don't know you, and I'm not interested in knowing you. So there was not at all any interest in the reason why something was was being done the way it was. And of course, we had those who decided to try and shame us, embarrass us, to say they spoke to students from other universities and they laughed at the complete disregard of these IT issues. And of course, which is a complete fabrication, that they received no feedback on our submissions. So you can see there's a lot of over-exaggeration that takes place in the, in, the, in, the, in the kind of things they were writing about. Then the second theme was my right to write. And that was pretty much composed of five things, telling the institution what we should be doing, refusing to abide by the netiquette guidelines, providing disinformation deliberately to other students, going underground to perpetuate discontent, and using the cost of the program as a weapon against us. So let's look at some examples from that. So typically here, in future, vet your tutors thoroughly to avoid childish behavior like this, there was a complaint of sarcastic comments on submitted work. 
any complaint that comes to me, I check in and I log, I log in and look. And all the tutor did was drop the little question there to say, do you mean this? And that they in interpret as being sarcastic and unprofessional. And then, of course, the use of YouTube videos, which tarnishes the image of the university and the quality of education. Just for everybody on the call, you need to know that all of our self-made narrated PowerPoints, lectures, are all loaded on a YouTube channel. It's a closed YouTube channel. So it, it, it doesn't link to what they're trying to say here. These are our lectures, and by no means are we tarnishing the image of the university, nor the quality of their education. And then, of course, refusing to abide by the netiquette guidelines. Initially, when a student writes, especially in this kind of situation, when they're not writing on their own behalf, but writing on everybody's behalf, I'll take us back to that in a moment, we refer them back to the netiquette video, which is very simple, which says, give us your name, your number, the module you're busy with, and raise your concern in the form of a question that we can answer. And so this is the kind of responses that we get after we've asked them to abide. And so they're saying it's 2021, so get on with it, whatever that might mean. And then, of course, this one, something or another gave, gives them a headache, but she, he or she means well, which, of course, I love it. It's very, um, doesn't, they don't really mean well. And then to continue, and so what we saw with this mob mentality is students went out of the way to provide disinformation to other students. And I never could quite decide what their motivation was. Was it to dissuade other students from continuing their studies? In other words, reducing the competition for master studies. That was one particular, but we don't know. So, for example, we see people post, posting in the emergency room, which is an uh, open uh, discussion forum, and they tell us things like, we are using the new edition, or they got the new edition, and we haven't been addressing it at all. That's factually incorrect. The new edition came out a few weeks ago. This is from last year. And then again, something that's factually incorrect, that the material does not, or the text, or the quiz, or whatever, does not correspond to textbooks. And so we see this deliberate disinformation that's being circulated amongst the students. Then going underground, so when I found or when we found these posts which were inappropriate, the emergency room is for an emergency after all, we would redirect them to say, please send that email to me, I will address it, because I happened to be involved in that module. Then in this particular case, they went and they took their, these kind of um, comments underground and they started posting it on academic posts. So let's say the academic post was, you had to, for example, say what you think are the causes of X, Y, and Z. And then we started to find these posts posted there, which had nothing to do with the academic discussion. So there was a deliberate attempt not to reach out to me, but then to rather try and hide it in other places where students could see it, not realizing that I was also looking. And then, of course, the lastly, by using the cost of the program as a weapon. So uh, it's making statements, sweeping statements, such as this is not what I'm paying for. And of course, I'm paying this amount of money and what studying on my own or watching YouTube videos makes no sense. But we must remember that this is the minority of the students. The vast majority of the students are, are we don't see this in the vast majority, but we did see this kind of behavior emerging and, and where one is influencing the others. I got several complaints where, for example, the students would say, we're writing to you on behalf of the whole class. And this is what we're referring to here, where there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation and rudeness going on. So our conclusion is that this relative anonymity of online learning promotes a sense of impunity as students wrote things they would never in their life have said to a professor in the classroom. They also showed skewed judgment and persistent belief in misinformation. So even after I replied, broke down their concerns, gave them information, I would still get the response, but this is not true. And I'd have to write back to say this is absolutely true. Um, they also showed confidence in their level of support from their fellow students. Um, they were quite convinced of the rightness of their cause, despite evidence to the contrary. And all of these traits are typical of mob mentality. And so this is interesting to us in an online environment, because we've never seen it in a face-to-face -face 
uh, environment. As I say, we think it's that sense of impunity, even though we warned them that a digital trail is a permanent trail. As a matter of fact, it's better for you to swear at a professor in class because there's no permanent record. Now we've got actually got a good record of people trying to bully lecturers. And so our take home message is that mob mentality can be a real threat in online programs and our current student codes of conduct need to be expanded to protect staff and other students because the current code of contact doesn't completely cover digital communication or online communication. It's very much rooted in the past where students would be in a classroom uh, rather than being in a digital classroom. So for that, or with that, I'd like to thank you. Um, thank Marie for all her patience and all the module coordinators in the program um, for, for sending through information out they sent through uh, information for us they've highlighted these things and that's been a very good source of information for us just to remind everybody that um, we any complaint is investigated and solved and you know and responded to but what we really saw here is that it was getting out of control where exactly 16 plus students can create havoc uh, and that people were influencing each other. And actually, we very seldom saw the perpetrator, the mob leader emerge. We would have a group of people writing to us to say, oh, this is how we feel. And when you get down to it, it they were not involved at all, but they've now heard along the grapevine and they felt empowered now to write, which is good because then we could at least you know, respond. But this, this sort of underground, under uh, movement and discussions was what we were seeing and uh, we could really one particular case was so bad we went to the deputy dean of teaching and learning and we realized we could not actually uh, do anything against that student because it's the the code of conduct didn't completely cover that and so we had to we had to uh, um, address it in very different ways so thank you to everybody i don't know if there were any questions marie Ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you so much. Sorry, sorry, Anki. Yes. I see that Chris asked here, how was it addressed? Okay, so I, I'm the program coordinator. So I'm one of the module coordinators, but I'm also the overarching program coordinator. So I ask all the module coordinators to send any of these big concerns, complaints, and the students also know they must come to me. And my strategy is to, is to only respond to, to facts and then, for example, to respond with facts. So if they say something works this way or we change groups every week, then the response would be, no, I did an interview with Dr. Marie van Veik. We did not change groups every week. Here it is. If they say they don't have enough time for a quiz, then we pull the metrics, the analytics out of the quiz and say that is not true. The group actually took, you know, 20 minutes and you had 40 minutes. So it's really fighting fighting this with facts. That's really interesting, Prof. Liz. So that means actually also that you have to respond to all of these and you cannot just leave it. Otherwise, it's going to, uh, to it elevate. Escalates. Yes, it yeah, does. Yeah. yeah. And so what I did find useful is at one stage when I had a nice long one, as I said to Marie, I don't mind doing this. It's a nice intellectual challenge to, to look and understand and so on. I actually did them a little video and narrated PowerPoint on learning styles and to explain why some people have a very emotional response to learning online. And that really, they must focus on their own learning and their own intellectual and emotional response mm -hmm. and not worry about the others because they were getting themselves uh, whipped up into this, into this frenzy and when, when I, as I said earlier, I, when I looked at them individually, none of the people who actually wrote were people involved. And so they were reacting to things in, an, in the online environment or WhatsApp group, as Prof. Gerdler Brown said. Uh, and then, I, then it calms down. So that once that group finished as well, it also became much quieter, Marie. Uh, we just recently had a bit of a, another one that came through, but it wasn't as bad as the first one. That was really interesting to listen to you, Prof. Liz. <laughs> we cannot actually imagine. And I see that one of the comments here was that um, we thought it's only um, 
a few of our own students here. So it means that um, thank you so much for, for um, conveying this message with all of us. And um, thank you everyone for attending this session. Uh, we can go now to the second session that's also going to present it. So, and that will be then um, Pedagogy and Aesthetics, Developing Online Learning Material for Health Sciences Programs at UFS. So thank you so much for attending this session. Thank you, everybody.